Hi, all. Um, I'm Donna McKay, the Executive Director of Physicians for Human Rights, PHR. And first, I want to thank you for joining us today for our speaker series on uh, timely health and human rights topics and implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been doing these, uh, these conversations since March of 2020, um, where we've welcomed leading national and international voices on health equity, human rights, science, medicine, and research, as well as voices from the front lines to this interactive platform. Um, and we've facilitated and inviting conversations on a broad range um, of topics and challenges that this global health crisis has laid bare. From the very first discussion in March last year, we've emphasized that science and public health must lead the way. And even before the pandemic emerged, uh, physical and psychological abuse and inadequate medical care have long been documented in ICE detention centers. Um, these settings regularly put the right to health at risk, which PHR has dedicated itself to exposing in order to protect the health and human rights of detained populations. Um, in January, PHR found that ICE detention centers in the US not only failed to comply with CDC COVID-19 safety guidelines, but people in detention struggled for access to basic, basic care and hygiene necessities like hand soap. Just last week, in partnership with our incredible colleagues at the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, uh, we released new research capturing the resilience and the activism of detained persons who organized hunger strikes in ICE detention facilities in a desperate protest of a lack of COVID-19 safety protocols in place. And you will hear more about the findings um, in a moment. So I'm thrilled to welcome hundreds of you live today uh, to discuss these issues. And I'm thrilled mostly to honor and honored to welcome my friend and my former colleague from the ACLU, Lee Gerlant is today's moderator. Lee is a remarkable civil rights lawyer at the ACLU where he serves as deputy director of the Immigrants' Rights Project and director of the project's access to the courts program. Um, as one of the leading public interest attorneys in the US, Lee has been at the forefront of challenging the former uh, president's inhumane and dehumanizing immigration policies. He led the national class action suit challenge to the Trump administration's unprecedented practice of separating immigrant families at the border. And most recently challenging the Trump administration's use of the title 42 public health law to expel unaccompanied migrant children without an asylum hearing at the US southern border. He's also an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School. Lee, thank you so much for the work that you and your colleagues do and for lending your valuable time today to moderate this really important conversation. So I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Donna, um, and to PHR for everything that you all have been doing and leading the way, combining advocacy with real medical expertise uh, has been invaluable in, in these fights. Um, I don't want to spend time giving my own views about what's going on now with COVID I, because we have an incredible uh, set of panelists. And so I want to just introduce them and get right to asking them questions. And hopefully that will spur uh, a dialogue among them and then also questions from the audience, which we would love to have and try and make this as interactive as possible. And, and this is, you know, like the other webinars that PHR has, has done, this is a really t obviously timely and, and critical um, webinar because tackling a very difficult issue. COVID is obviously a serious issue. Um, and when you combine that with all the tricky issues that arise in the immigration context, it becomes that much more difficult. And th there's always a danger that people in detention, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. And our country will ultimately be judged in this period by not only how we tackled COVID generally, but how we dealt with the, pe the most vulnerable people. And among those most vulnerable people is certainly those who have been locked away in ICE detention facilities. So let me start by introducing the panelists and then begin by asking them some questions. Um, our first panelist is Nielsen Barahona Mariaga. He is a native Honduran who immigrated to the United States more than two decades ago. In 2019, he was detained by ICE at the Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia, 
where he and other detained people organized a hunger, stri hunger strike to protest ICE's lack of COVID-19 safety protocols and the detention of elderly people and those at high risk of contracting the disease. Eunice Cho is a senior staff attorney at the ACLU National Prison Project where she focuses her work on challenging unconstitutional conditions in US immigration detention facilities and the expansion of immigration detention. She leads the ACLU's litigation efforts around COVID-19 in immigration detention centers. And she is a colleague of mine and a truly amazing advocate and lawyer. Josiah Jody Rich is a professor of medicine and a Bidal, <laughs> Uh, professor of medicine at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University and a practicing infectious disease and addiction specialist at the Miriam Hospital in Rhode Island Department of Corrections. He is the director, co-founder of the Center on Health and Justice Transformation at the Miriam Hospital and co-founder of the Nationwide Centers for AIDS Research Collaboration on HIV in Corrections, uh, the Corrections Initiative. Dr. Rich also consults as a subject matter expert on detention health for the Department of Homeland Security, DHS's Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. He will be speaking in his own capacity, on, not on behalf of DHS, and he has been one of the leading voices on COVID and detention. Uh, and finally, Sophia Terp is an associate uh, professor of clinical emergency medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California, USC, and a clinical scholar at the USC Leonard Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. Um, so welcome to you all. Let me start, I wanna start and also end with Eunice. <clears throat> Eunice, I think there's a lot of people who are potentially a lot of people listening today who are not entirely familiar with who actually gets locked up in immigration detention centers. I think there may be, um, a misguided view that these are all hardened criminals and we need to lock them up while they go through their immigration proceedings. Can you just give us a sense of the array of different types of people who get locked up in ICE detention centers often for a significant uh, period? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think what's important for us to remember about immigration detention is that it is civil in nature, not criminal. Uh, but at the same time, it is an incredibly sprawling infrastructure that uh, basically uh, are using the same facilities, prisons, jails, um, former prisons and jails nationwide. People who are in detention are in you know, are all folks who are awaiting adjudication of their immigration cases during the pendency of their, their proceedings. And these are civil proceedings, as I said earlier. So this includes people like asylum seekers who have come to the United States in search of safety from persecution. It includes undocumented people from our communities who may have come into contact with the criminal justice system in some way, uh, sometimes for issues as minor as a broken taillight or a traffic ticket and then only to have their undocumented status detected and having them transferred into immigration custody. And what we find, of course, is that people in immigration detention, once they are in there, it is incredibly diff difficult to get out. Um, uh, you know, statistics vary across the country, but um, bond and parole rates can be very challenging, um, uh, challenging to obtain. And oftentimes people can be detained for several months, if not years, as they appeal their cases. So, um, you know, and this is an indefinite period of time without any, um, you know, sentence that ends it. The, the other thing to remember is that right now there are 26,000 people um, per day that are detained in over 200 facilities nationwide. And just to kind of ground us in the context for today, there are currently 831 positive cases that are under uh, isolation or monitoring as of the 24th of June. Those are COVID-19 cases, although we know for certain that the number of people who have been diagnosed and tested positive for COVID is absolutely higher. Um, so these are all important numbers to, to think about as we continue our conversation today. Thanks so much. And just to sort of put a point on it, these can be asylum seekers and do you have to have a criminal conviction to be one of these 26,000 people detained? No, uh, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of people who have no criminal conviction whatsoever that are being locked up in detention. Right, so these are people who fled danger came to this country, are seeking asylum, their asylum proceedings are ongoing, they have no criminal history, and yet they're in detention. 
That's right. And it really leads us to ask the question, why are we detaining um, all of these people in the first place? Um, there certainly must be better alternatives uh, than to be um, locking people up for this much amount of time. Okay, great. Thanks, Eunice. Um, Sophie, let me turn to you. Can you give an overview of what you've seen in ICE detention facilities during the pandemic and sort of a sense, overall sense of whether there have been fatalities due to COVID? So while morbidity related to COVID-19 in detention facilities has been significant, reporting, um, as has been mentioned previously, has been variable and therefore difficult to accurately quantify. Um, however, because of reporting mandates established by the Department of Homeland Security in 2018, we are a better able to quantify the most one of the most serious outcomes of COVID-19 disease, which is death. So I recently published a report describing deaths in ICE detention during a period that overlapped with the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. Um, and since March 2020, when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be a pandemic, there have been nine deaths attributable to COVID-19 reported among individuals in ICE custody. And while the average daily population in detention dropped substantially during fiscal year 2020 compared to the prior year, the number of in custody deaths increased from eight in fiscal year 2019 to 21 in fiscal year 2020 with more than a sevenfold increase in the overall death rate um, between the two years. Um, between April and September of 2020, three quarters of all deaths of individuals in ICE custody and 80% of medical in custody deaths were attributable to COVID-19. It's worth noting that all individuals in our study who died of COVID-19 had been in detention for at least two weeks prior to hospital transfer with an average of 30 days in custody prior to terminal hospital transfer. So. Um, Presumably, many of these people caught COVID-19 in custody rather than prior to uh, detention. It's also important to note that these numbers really underestimate COVID-19 deaths related to ICE detention. Um, and while the 2018 Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill requires ICE to make public all reports regarding in-custody deaths within 90 days, um, this requirement is not always met in the time frame required, um, but also does not apply to individuals who have been released from custody. And there have been numerous media reports um, that indicate that at least two other individuals died of COVID-19 related illness shortly after release from ICE detention. So COVID-19 has really emerged as an important cause of mortality report, responsible for 80% of medical deaths in detained individuals in the second half of fiscal year 2020. And the majority of these deaths occurred among detained individuals whose age or um, baseline medical conditions such as diabetes or hypertension place them at high risk for severe illness or death from COVID-19. And so, you know, while transmission of COVID-19 and other respiratory illnesses in general um, can theoretically be prevented to some degree with safety measures such as masks, hand hygiene, social distancing, these measures are extremely challenging, if not impossible, to implement in often crowded detention environments. So while COVID-19 vaccines were not generally available during the period that I studied, um, study findings really highlight how immunizations for COVID-19 really need to be prioritized, particularly for detained individuals whose age or comorbid conditions place them at increased risk for mortality, and whether release, especially of high-risk individuals, um, when that can be uh, done, you know, might be beneficial for the health of individuals who are high risk in detention. Thanks so much, Sophie. And I'm gonna ask you and all the other panelists in case you have a sense of this. Do you know whether the rates of, of the fatality rates from COVID in ICE detention mirrors what we're seeing for people in criminal custody? Um, do you have a sense of that? I don't have a great sense of it because of the sort of differences in reporting structures, um, but I imagine um, I work at a facility in Los Angeles County where we see a uh, 
large population of um, uh, individuals who are incarcerated. And um, I would say that the numbers that I saw in my report seem like they're probably uh, like possibly higher than what I had seen just based on my clinical experience. But this is just anecdotal. Okay, thanks. Um, Nelson, let me turn to you because what I don't want to have happen is that this become too abstract a conversation. And you're the person who actually lived through this and were in a facility. So can you talk a little bit about what you saw, what your experience was, um, and what you were hoping to achieve through the hunger strike? Uh, first, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to do this, uh, uh, to share my, my story. Uh, this is one of the things that, um, that I wanted to do, you know, as soon as I come out, uh, share my story, because uh, I, have, I have said many times that people, they go through the, the, the tension like I have. Once they come out of the tension, they really uh, don't want to talk about it no more. You know, they don't, they don't want to relieve this story because it, it's really hard. It's really hard to talk about things that you went through and not to uh, have a flashback, you know. And, and a flashback is not only images and, and, and noise, but all the feelings that you had at that time. And it's not a, it's not a, it's not a good feeling. So, uh, but one question, um, it was very, very, I, I would say it was like a, like a moment because first of all, we didn't receive any type of information from the authorities about what was happening with the COVID-19. Uh, Everything we knew about it, we knew it because of the media and, 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 you know, we keep seeing things and, and, and numbers going up of people be getting contagious and then uh, people uh, passing away because of it. And then they started talking about the uh, health uh, conditions that can make it a higher risk, like uh, diabetes and low pressure and, uh, you know, uh, all these things. And, and yet, we are they were denying that all of these things were happening. We tried to talk to the guards, we tried to talk to the ICE officers every time they come. Uh, and they keep denying, you know, okay. But the reality is that we knew that if people on the outside, people who had the chance to take care of themselves people who had the chance to go to a hospital and then be admitted into a hospital and taken to an emergency room, they were still dying. And, and we, we, we imagine what will happen to ourselves if, if we let this virus infiltrate the facility. Because to get a, you know, for, for example, I, I'm a, I have high blood pressure and diabetes and there were many times when my blood pressure went up and I try to get the medicine, you know, uh, but I wouldn't, I couldn't, because we, we have a need have to put a pickle and paper, and they will, you know, like, toss it down the trash and forget about it. And we, we wouldn't be called back, like, and by that time, too late. I have uh, uh, I have witnessed uh, this old man. He he was from Africa. He was feeling bad, and he keep knocking on the door so he can get his uh, pill for high blood pressure. They didn't do it. He ended up having a heart attack because they didn't give him the high blood pressure on time. So these kind of things make us, you know, realize that. If we let this virus infiltrate the facility, we were gonna be in a much worse situation than people on the outside. And the way we try to uh, uh, get the attention of the uh, ICE 
authorities and 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 the media on the outside to what was happening uh we thought there was there was no other way to do it that uh doing a hunger strike and uh so that's the reason why we did it you know uh while while being on a hunger strike even knowing that all we are demanding is for 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 the for them to give us face masks to give us uh hand sanitizer you know the kind of things that we are supposed to have in the first place right and and as soon as we get uh started this hunger strike the facility decided that the best thing for them to do was to cut off the water they cut off the water for the sink they cut off the water for the toilet and they put in a much worse position now we are not only uh in the middle of a pandemia and we don't have the things that we need to take care of ourselves but we can't even wash our hands or flush the toilet so these are these are the kind of things that make me want to come and tell my story you know because people is suffering in detention i mean it's not is is not only being far away from the family it's not only about being threat to send to to be sent back to your country you know a place that if for 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 any for reason but it is all the like your emotions not only your mental health but physically these these things um Nissen, are you um sorry I I can't hear you anymore. Are you, were you finished or is there, is there a computer yeah, glitch? Yeah. Oh, you were. Okay. So I just want to thank you for, for sharing that because as you said in the beginning, it can be so traumatizing to have to relive that and talk about it and your courage in talking about it so that people can become aware of what's going on it is so critical. Um, did you feel when you were in the detention center that people in the outside world knew what was going on inside these detention centers? Definitely, you know, uh, we felt isolated. Uh, and we felt like we were being ignored because we knew what was happening on the outside. It was kind of over overwhelming, you know? And, and of course, for the public, they, it would be easy to think, okay, they are on, on ICE detention, they are on, on their federal uh, custody, they, might, they must be being very well taken care of. And that wasn't the case. So uh, for us to do this, it was, it, from, from, at least from my point of view, it was, it was vital, you know? Like I, I needed to do this because I needed to make sure that people on the outside knew what we were going through, you know. And, and and like I said before, not only that, but we needed the public to know that when even when they have the chance to take care of themselves, we were put in the hands of people who didn't really care about what's happening with us because they wasn't wasn't providing any of the things that we were supposed to have. And, and there was no way we could do anything to help ourselves because we were put on this place where we depend totally on the authorities on these detention centers. Right. Well, thank you again for sharing that. I wanna come back to you with a few questions, but now uh, maybe we can turn to Dr. Rich. And Jody, can you talk to the, the question that's out there, I think from a lot of people um, who say, well, there's just no way to deal with COVID when people are in detention. Um, and you know, I think one of the, the solutions is obviously, as Eunice pointed out, that people do not need to be detained who are seeking asylum, uh, that there are very few people in ICE detention who really need to be detained, um, and that there are alternative ways to ensure people's appearance at their hearings. But short of actual release, I mean, I, I want you to talk about overall, but short of actual release, are there things that could be done in detention centers 
to reduce the risk? Sure. So the basic problem is you have too many people in too small a space. They're just on top of each other and they're breathing the same air. Um, and now that we know this is a not only a droplet borne disease, but a respiratory airborne pathogen that um, it's, if you're in a confined space and you're breathing the same air, you're gonna see outbreaks. Um, now, uh, and, and people have the misconception about the detention facilities and, and correctional uh, prisons and jails altogether in that, oh, well, they're isolated uh, and they're, they're in their own little bubbles. Um, they're not bubbles. There are people coming in and out every shift because you have staff that work there and they generally live in the surrounding community. So you have a situation where you have a super spreader environment that has people coming and going. And, and it's even more complex with ICE and, and also many other detention facilities because they keep shuffling the deck. They move people around to different facilities. So it's bad enough that you have one facility that is high risk for spread. And the very nature of this facility is that you have people coming and going that can bring it in from the outside. Um, but, uh, but then you spread it to other facilities. Um, so it's, uh, it's a perfect storm. Now, you asked earlier, Lee, about um, whether the uh, rates or you know, transmission are comparable in, in ICE detention as in prisons and jails. I would turn everyone's attention to the COVID prison project, which I think has the best data on this and comparison data. And they have, um, they can, they, they, on that website, you'll find much more um, uh, detail. Um, and and uh, I agree with Sophie about limitations of the reporting uh, uh, there, but, but my sense is that they're fairly comparable in that there are massive outbreaks. And in fact, 90 of the 100 largest outbreaks in the country have been in correctional facilities. Uh, it's, these are the worst places. You know, we think about nursing homes, we think about meatpacking factories. These are highly conducive to a very efficient spread of this virus. Um, now, you asked about what can be done. Um, you know, you need to be very smart about it. And I would point out that, you know, there's no reason why people who are trained and learned to run a correctional facility would necessarily know uh, how to address the public health crisis. And similarly, people with public health expertise uh, generally have very little knowledge about how uh, correctional facilities run. So what this pandemic has, has highlighted uh, first of all, the severe vulnerability that we have created with mass incarceration and mass detention facilities, um, and that hopefully we will have learned a lesson there. Um, I think ultimately the best uh, short-term answer is to, is to get as many people as you can out of those facilities, because then you have a little room. Now, if many facilities are at, you know, at or above capacity. And if you don't have any place to quarantine people, then you're in trouble. The, you know, the masks help, the, the hygiene helps, the, um, um, the quarantining to the extent you can do that, the testing people coming in and coming out, um, and all that can help. Um, but I think right now we're at a different point in the, uh, in the pandemic, certainly in the US, uh, in that vaccines is really where things are now that we know these vaccines are highly effective. We don't know how effective ultimately they're gonna be against uh, variants. Um, but when you think about variants, you know, we know that viruses replicate uh, very rapidly, that they uh, uh, mutate rapidly, that, um, uh, and, and that we are talking about uh, millions and millions of viral particles in an individual and then literally millions and hundreds of millions of people uh, with this, we are, uh, and our, our nation's failure to get high rates of vaccination um, in, in our general public 
uh, we unfortunately are vulnerable to rapid spreading um, uh, variants that are going to be challenging the effectiveness of these of the current vaccines we have. So, so far, it's looking, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's far better than uh, it could have been, uh, but we, I can't really predict which way things are going to go. Um, you know, we've seen, we've seen variants uh, uh, cause trouble already. And, uh, but, but in the meantime, we have highly effective vaccines that we should be rolling out. And I would, would point out that, uh, you know, in the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, we, uh, you know, aggressively rolled out vaccine uh, early on. Uh, California has done uh, an amazing job rolling out vaccine in their, in their state correctional facilities and, uh, and many other places. And the acceptance rates among detained people have been uh, uh, much higher than the general public. And, you know, when you, uh, when you think about it, I mean, I, I can't say enough about <clears throat> Nielsen's courage to come and, and speak up and, and do the things he's done. Um, but I think he gave you a sense of what it's like to be incarcerated, be powerless. You can't even get, uh, you know, soap to wash your hands. You can't even uh, get a mask to cover you. There's, there's nothing you can do uh, that, that, that everyone else in the world can do uh, to protect yourself. And you're seeing people getting sick around you, hearing about people dying, you can't even get medications. I mean, this is, this is a horrible. The, the mental health implications of having gone through that are tremendous on a huge population. Um, and yet, uh, you know, people are, you know, they're, they're, if, if you give them an opportunity to get a vaccine, uh, to give them some, some ability to protect, get protection that, uh, that you will uh, uh, get, uh, you know, high rates of acceptance. And if you don't, then there's obviously something wrong with, uh, with the, uh, the way it's being presented or, or, or so. Um, but I would, you know, point out in this situation, you know, we have the federal government coordinating vaccine efforts and it's not a trivial issue to the logistics involved with, with the distributing vaccine. And they've done a, you know, a, a Herculean, Herculean job in the community getting vaccines out there in a record time. And the, you know, with just tens of thousands of people, this, you know, could be done in, literally in a blink of an eye. Um, and yet, Here's the federal government not providing what they should provide. Um, so I would say, that, you know, the, the 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 first thing you can do is get as many people out as possible, and the second thing is vaccinate as many people as possible. At this point in the epidemic. Thanks. That that's a really helpful overview. Um, I just want to ask a couple of quick follow-up questions. You had mentioned that the guards. It's not a bubble because among other things, the guards come in and out and the correctional officers come in and out because they're on different shifts and they obviously don't sleep there. Do you have any sense of what the vaccine rate is for ICE correctional officers? What percentage are, they obviously have the opportunity. I mean, now at this point, everyone does, but they presumably had an opportunity early on to get the vaccine. I don't, uh, I haven't seen uh, good data on that. There may be some on the COVID Prison Project website, but the, um, in general, many of these facilities are residing in states that have some of the lowest vaccine rates in the country. Um, and I would anticipate that many of those uh, correctional officers are, uh, you know, are just similar in many ways to the population they're coming from. I, you know, the, the response to date has been that, uh, well, you should, you know, the, these, the local health authorities should address vaccination. Uh, and I think something like only 10% of, uh, of uh, people who've been, uh, are in ICE detention have been uh, even gotten even a single dose of the vaccine uh, last I heard. So um, obviously that's not working, uh, that system. Uh, I think it's it's high time for the feds to step in and as um, uh, Pam McPherson, Scott Allen, and I 
are all uh, consultants to um, uh, Homeland Security uh, and uh, subject matter experts. And we have uh, uh, strongly encouraged them uh, to, um, uh, to, to address that along with mental health issues. And in fact, on Friday, just sent a letter uh, to Congress uh, strongly encouraging that. And um, I think there's a report on, uh, there's some news reports and, and that letter that can be put into the, uh, put into the chat. Great. Um, and I just want to re-emphasize that you're here though, in your personal capacity speaking today. Correct. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, and one other question, I want to make sure we have time for Eunice and audience questions, but this is not the first pandemic. It may be different. Some people say it's the most extreme, but it's certainly not the first time we've had a pandemic. Do you, do you have a sense of how pandemics have been handled in ICE facilities previously and whether there's been lessons learned or have those, have those lessons not actually been learned and we could have learned lessons previous from previous outbreaks? You know, but certainly the, uh, this is the biggest pandemic in any of our lifetime. Um, and I, I, so there is, in, in many ways, there is no precedent, but there are, you know, we've been well aware of airborne pathogens. The, the most uh, prominent one that's you know, a deadly pathogen is tuberculosis. Right. Um, and every correctional facility in the country has uh, at least in writing, a plan to deal with tuberculosis, to screen people, to identify them, to isolate them, to get them treated. Um, and so I think, you know, we need that. I, I just would point out that in the U.S., we are incarceration crazy. We lock up a higher proportion of our, of our citizenry uh, and and, and, and uh, immigrants than any other civilization in the history of mankind. We're, we're way out of line with the rest of the world uh, and way out of line with historically. So we somehow or other, every other society has figured out how to survive without uh, locking up so many people. I think we can do it. I think we need to do it. Uh, and this pandemic has, has just pointed out the folly of that. And on the tuberculosis point, so you said that there's isolation, there's protocols. Did the same protocols immediately get in, put in place for COVID or was there something about COVID, maybe the politicization of it or something else in, that ICE facilities didn't react in the same way that they have with respect to tuberculosis or other, or were the same, was it just hard, a harder I, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it was a rapidly evolving situation. Um, so, uh, and the CDC guidance uh, was, uh, I felt slow to come up, come online and was uh, not, um, uh, you know, was evolving and was, was hard to, uh, uh, um, hard to stay on top of. So I think you know, there's, there are many um, healthcare and administrative correctional professionals working in ICE detention and correctional facilities across the country doing the best they can. And the ones that were most effective coordinated with local public health authorities uh, to, to actually work together uh, to look, you know, for the, so the public health authorities could learn about uh, corrections uh, and, and what's possible, what's not possible. Um, and so I think, you know, um, testing, being smart about quarantining, um, there, there are quite a number of things that can be done. Ultimately, the fundamental problem you have is just too many people in too small a situation. Okay. Um, let me turn now to Eunice. Eunice, the ACLU, you and the ACLU and other organizations have brought a fair number of lawsuits dealing with COVID and, and ICE detention. Can you give the audience a, a sort of overview sense of what that litigation was trying to accomplish and where things stand now and whether that litigation has evolved given 
that we now have a vaccine, just sort of a sense of the advocacy and the litigation. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, back in March 2020, which seems like a very long time ago at this point, um, you know, we all heard about what was happening with respect to COVID-19. And I think what became very clear was that ICE correctional facilities had little to no plan as to how to deal with this crisis. And um, as um, public health professionals like Dr. Rich and others warned um, everyone was that this was a disaster waiting to happen. And it became very clear that as public health professionals had recommended that one of the only ways to save people, especially those who are medically vulnerable to serious illness or death from COVID-19 at that point, was to get them out of custody so that they could uh, safely um, protect themselves, uh, socially distance and do what everybody else was doing, which was to uh, isolate themselves and try to avoid catching COVID-19 in the first place. And so, you know, as early as March 2020, the ACLU brought uh, more than 40 cases on behalf of detained people in 32 facilities nationwide. Um, and we coordinated, of course, with our partners uh, in other parts of the country, around the country, to um, file lawsuits um, on an unprecedented scale um, to release people um, and to also demand better conditions um, in detention facilities. Um, our, our litigation resulted in the release of over 800 people as well as population caps on some facilities uh, that limited the detention of even more people in those facilities. Um, it also resulted in court orders that required the release of medically vulnerable people from detention, um, reductions in detention populations to allow for social distancings, bars from, for transfers from certain facilities, as Dr. Rich talked about, what ICE was doing at one point was um, knowingly moving people from uh, facilities with known outbreaks to new facilities uh, for a number of reasons, uh, further spreading um, outbreaks of COVID-19, um, and also ordering that ICE provide tests, soap, masks, and vaccines uh, to people in detention. Um, what we found during uh, the litigation was, of course, that ICE failed to take basic precautions to protect people in their care. So we know that people were, like Nelson, like Nelson was talking about, people were sleeping and eating and bathing in these crowded uh, units um, without basic means like soap, masks, cleaning supplies. And oftentimes ICE was aware of the fact that COVID was present in the facility, but did not ever tell people, uh, including their staff, that there had been uh, you know, active cases found. Um, and thousands of people, um, of course, grew ill as a result. Um, to this day, we don't actually know how many people truly um, got sick or died as a result of COVID-19. Part of this is because of the lack of transparency uh, of ICE uh, to begin with. Um, we don't know, for example, how many guards, um, most of whom are employed by private prison companies, actually uh, contracted COVID-19. The reports that we have are purely from media reports and not from the government. And uh, one, you know, we, we know that uh, these private prison companies also, um, you know, worsened the conditions in many uh, cases. Uh, in one detention facility, for example, detained people were offered masks, but only if they signed a liability waiver of releasing Core Civic, the private prison company, from uh, any potential lawsuits. Um, we also know that the use of force increased to record levels, and, um, and this was especially true against people who were asking for many of these basic protections, people who were going on hunger strike, people who were um, you know, signing peaceful petitions uh, for these protections we saw the growing use of solitary confinement and retaliation against people in detention. And so conditions really grew very dire during this period of time. Um, I think the other thing that is really important for us to know is just the lack of transparency by ICE. As Sophie mentioned, um, we know several of our clients, uh, class action members, um, have, have died as a result of COVID-19, but ICE actually never uh, re you know, released this information publicly because uh, they actually released people from custody before the person passed away uh, on death's door. Uh, so they avoided reporting requirements either to the court or to the general public. Um, this is, of course, a very troubling situation given the number of people who are detained. ICE's uh, recalcitrance, generally speaking, um, to re release people from detention, and um, as we know, the, the life and death stakes at hand. 
I think now you, you asked about what's happening in, in our litigation with the advent of vaccinations. Um, one thing that we're seeing is that, uh, you know, vaccines are making a huge difference uh, in our country as well as in detention centers, but ICE has been far behind the curve in terms of what is necessary in terms of a robust response to, to detention. So as of uh, the last publicly available information that we have is as of May 7th, only 7% of people in ICE detention had been vaccinated. And this was due in large part to a very scattershot um, uh, implementation of vaccinations where each individual facility was instructed to obtain its own vaccine supply from local public health sources. Now, as one can imagine, um, that led to a great deal of confusion and a, a, a total failure um, of a nationwide coordinated response to make sure that people in detention were getting vaccinated. Um, Coupled with the fact that, uh, as you had alluded to, um, vaccination rates of staff in detention facilities is incredibly low. Um, you know, there are uh, there's no kind of national accounting of it, but you know, at different facilities, the rate has been as low as 20 to 30 percent, um, which of course uh, raises in increasing concerns given um, you know information about uh, variants. Um, uh, however, um, we do believe that with a, a robust um, vaccine nation protocol that this can be uh, rapidly improved and that I certainly has the tools uh, to do so. Thanks, Eunice. I just want to, um, I don't know if this is a question for you or one of the other panelists, but it's coming in from the audience. Um, is there any data publicly available on the rate of community spread in, in areas around particular ICE detention facilities? There is some data, and I think it's not it's not systematic. Um, you know, we can point to um, the New York Times did a great uh, study of the impact of. Uh, COVID-19 in ICE detention facilities, you know, it, it actually found that the infection rate in immigration detention facilities was five times that of prisons and 20 times that of the general public. And it also looked at, um, at, at particular areas, uh, for example, in Texas and in the South, where there were um, measurable increases in terms of community spread uh, outside the detention facility after there were outbreaks in ICE detention. Um, I would look at the COVID prison project uh, that is Run by the UCLA that has also um, tracked a lot of that data. Thanks. Um, I'd encourage the audience to send in additional questions in the chat. I guess I was interested for any of the panels, including what Nielsen saw in his own experience or any of the other panelists, as putting aside the vaccine, did ICE facilities get better about how they were handling COVID or was it only because of litigation and the threat of litigation that they got better? Did they begin to take steps, you know, whether it was whistleblowers or litigation that made things at least better to the extent they could, either by releasing people, having quarantine areas or anything else? Do you want to start, Eunice? And then sure. Well, I can say that um, we do believe that litigation had an important <clears throat> impact in terms of the way that um, ICE facilities were um, managing COVID in these detention facilities. Uh, first, it forced um, the uh, release of thousands of people who are medically vulnerable um, in ICE custody. And certainly that was not something that ICE had been actively doing before court orders had been issued. Um, you know, in many instances, um, you know, ICE began testing uh, people in, in detention only as a result of court orders and reporting that information. Um, we, we found that same to be true of vaccination um, and other protocols. So um, in many of these court orders, you can see how uh, the court brought ICE to task to take many of these very basic uh, safety protocols that had been recommended by public health experts nationwide. And did you see a change in the federal government's position from the prior administration to the Biden administration? in how they were dealing with COVID-19. I think this is a question that all the panelists can talk to a little bit. Um, but Eunice, can you start just by, was there a difference in how they responded to the litigation or generally were dealing with COVID protocols? I think it's, um, that's a very good question. I think we're optimistic that certainly an administration that has prioritized um, an orderly vaccine rollout um, 
would be more open to that. Uh, we are still, uh, we are now in a lot of settlement proceedings with the government at this point. Um, those are, of course, confidential discussions. Um, uh, we are, it is our hope and sincere hope that um, the Biden administration takes less of an uh, oppositional approach to these cases than I think uh, the prior administration for sure. Okay, uh, thanks. And I think any of the other panelists, did you see ICE even apart from threat of litigation and whether it was a change in administration or not, getting better when professionals, medical experts were telling them you need to do this, this, and this, and ICE being responsive and having lessons learned or were was there resistance throughout and it didn't change much from the beginning of the pandemic through? Um, uh, on my case, uh, personally, I can I was resistant again. Uh, uh, I was there. Was it Nielsen? Or did we lose Nielsen? Um, so there's another audience question, a good question about trauma and whether there has been mental health responses um, for trauma suffered. I think um, Nielsen. Nielsen. Um, uh, I was saying that uh, I was because of my patients because I have uh, diabetes and the uh, blood pressure, but you know. They did not have actually call me for a meeting with the ICE officers. Can you hear me? I think it's it's a little bit hard, Nielsen. So um, if you want to, I, I think we'll try and come back to you if the connection issues can be fixed. I'm so sorry. Um, I don't know, maybe Sophie or... or um, Dr. Rich, do you want to um, talk a little about whether things improve? But I think before before that, maybe deal with the, the trauma issue and whether there has been um, any response to dealing with the mental health trauma that that obviously the detainees suffered going through this. I think you had mentioned it, Jody, but I think both of you maybe could jump in on this. Yeah, go ahead, Sophie, if you want to. Um, so. I can't speak much to the response to trauma um, on behalf of ICE detention, but I um, can speak a little bit about the ultimate effects of whatever is happening in facilities. I've looked at um, updated data from the last six months, and um, it does appear that the death rate in ICE detention overall is still much higher than it was in 2018 or 2019, though it does appear somewhat decreased from, uh, from the 2020 fiscal year when during sort of the peak of the COVID pandemic. So it's in, you know, still too high, but um, at least decreased from the prior year. And there still are deaths occurring um, during that period from COVID-19. So both among persons in custody and those recently released from custody. So. Okay, thanks. And, and um, Jody, you had mentioned, you had talked a little about the mental health response. Sure. And so is ICE... Do you feel like ICE is taking that seriously or are people having to go to private places to get mental health um, care? I, uh, well, I, I can't really comment on that, but I, I will point out that, you know, this is a, a population that has already been traumatized right. before they got here in, in, in large degree. Um, and, and this is, you know, and you heard it very, clearly from Nielsen that people don't want to even talk about what they've been through because of fear of flashback coming back to this, you know, this sort of helplessness. I mean, can you imagine asking at the window for three days in a row for your blood pressure medicine and then having a heart attack and everyone else seeing that same scenario happen, uh, having your, you know, try to do something and then have the water shut off. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's the, 
the trauma is a major thing, and we did include that in the letter uh, to Congress um, uh, recently. And so I think that is uh, that is a key uh, a key issue, um, and and needs a lot of attention. And if I can just interject really quickly to yeah. build on the trauma point, um, I, I, I do want to take a, an opportunity to, to just mention the report that the ACLU and Physicians for Human Rights uh, published last week. Um, it's called Behind Closed Doors, Abuse and Retaliation of Hunger Strikers and ICE Detention. And uh, Nilsen, of course, is uh, one of the um, people who are detained and uh, can, you know, uh, participate in hunger strike that is profiled in the report. But the report looks at over 10,000 pages of documents regarding hunger strikes uh, that we recovered under the Freedom of Information Act from ICE. And it really provides a firsthand look at um, the trauma and abuse that happens uh, of people who are participating in hunger strikes um, in ICE detention. So I hope that folks can have a chance to take a look at that as well. Great, thanks Eunice. Um, I think that we are coming to the end. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, Additional questions. Okay, so I am going to um, turn it back to Donna. Donna, do you want to um, close? I don't know if if, oh. if there is a chance. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely, Nielsen. Yes, that'd be good okay. for you. To close. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'm kind of dealing with the the, the connection over here, but uh, what what I really wanted to say is that uh, in my case, uh, even uh, when I was released because I have my my health condition. Uh, they deny a couple of times that I have them, even when they have the full records of my of, of my medical uh, records. And uh, they call me once to see uh, ICE officers, and they say, "Oh, we don't find any of your records." Even when my lawyers keep uh, pushing the fact that I have these medical conditions in order for them to release me, yet yeah, they say that they don't have the the, the information saying that I was uh, medical. Medicare uh, vulnerable to the to the COVID nineteen, uh, so I think the the common sense of the people who is in detention is the fact that uh, for an example, I was detained, I, I was detained in, in two different uh, centers, right? I was in Irwin County first, and then I was transferred to uh, Stewart Detention Center. These these places are run by private corporations. Uh, which is like sale and core civic. Um, they have a contract with, uh, with ICE in Homeland Security. And, and in these contracts, they have certain number of, of beds available for ICE. And when the pandemic hit, of course, ICE stopped uh, catching so many people on the outside because of, the, of COVID-19. So those that was on the inside, they try to keep them there for as long as they can because they have to cover these contracts that they have with private corporations, which is, is, is totally crazy. On my case, it was determined from the very beginning of it that I was not a fly risk. If I am not a fly risk, what is the point of me being away from my family for a year and one month? When I was detained, my son, was five years old. How do you expect for a little kid to know why his father is not in the house? My wife went through hard times trying to keep up with the bills and everything else, you know. She's a United States citizen. You don't realize that you are hurting your own people by doing this. She was put in a, in a lot of pressure, you know? And I decided to become an activist because of this kind of thing. This shouldn't be happening. And I know even I am released right now, I'm with my family, but there is thousands of families that are going through the same thing. There is thousands of kids that are going through the same thing. There are thousands of wives that are going through the same thing and husbands as well, you know? This is not fair. This is not fair. So that's the reason why I take the courage to speak up and say what I went through, because I want people to know that this is real. This is a real problem. 
this is not this is not fiction this is not a movie we are not talking about things that are happening far away from here this is happening in u.s soil and it shouldn't be happening this shouldn't be happening this country is known as one of the biggest leaders on human rights movement how come these kind of things are happening in u.s soil it's really hard to understand but I still have hope, you know? I have hope that when people listen to my story, they can realize that we need to do something to change this system. And that's the reason why I speak up. That's the reason why I love to participate on this kind of things uh, and event. And, and I take the, the opportunity every time I get it, you know, to share my story. And I appreciate you guys for giving me that chance to do so today. Thank you so much for, for being here and for sharing your story. I think it is so critical for people to hear your powerful story and the, and the powerful way you tell it, if we are going to ever try to, to end these types of practices. Um, I want to turn it back to Donna, who I think will close out the webinar. And thank you all, panelists, for, for really compelling um, presentations and to PHR and Donna for all the work that you are doing. Donna. Thanks, Lee. Um, first and foremost, Nelson, I'm so sorry for the experience that you had and should never have had. And, um, and I can't thank you enough for joining us and for sharing your experience. Um, it comes at a big cost to you because you have to relive your experience every time you share it. Um, and I know you're doing it for a greater cause, but you're remarkable. And, um, and so we have a great we have so much gratitude and are indebted to you for what you're doing. Um, and I also, you know, I, I, I wanna thank all of you for being with us today to make sure that as Lee opened up to say that, that out of sight does not become out of mind um, and that the most vulnerable among us deserve our, our everything um, to protect their health and safety and their human rights. Um, I think that this, listening to this panel today, we just reinforce the, in, the importance of these partnerships between medical and legal organizations. Um, and, uh, and so I really applaud all the work that the panelists are doing to make sure that these issues are, are at the forefront. We, we should be phasing out immigration detention. It should never happen in this society. And there are humane community-based alternatives and that has to be our focus as the panelists said today. So one thing that people can do who've listened to this incredibly powerful conversation today is just to share it. It will be up on the website of BHR and the ACLU. And, and um, so, so please put it on your social media pages and just share it with those who, who are in a position to, uh, to act and, um, and also share the reports as well with the really important recommendations because in those reports, there are actions that every one of us can take. So thank you very much for joining us. Lee, you did an amazing job again um, in moderating this panel and thank you to all the panelists. We're so grateful.